Welcome back. You're watching 101. We're speaking with renowned neurologist and best-selling author, Dr. Oliver Sachs. Uh, Dr. Sachs, uh, one of the, the things that really brought you to prominence was your, uh, your, your use of um, L-DOPA, which was an experimental drug uh, at the time uh, with patients with encephalitis lethargica, which was the, the 1920 sleeping sickness. That, that really, uh, that was obviously um, highlighted in, in the book that you wrote, Awakenings, made into a film, uh, Oscar-nominated film with Robert De Niro and, and Robin Williams, and, and even became a, a play, Harold Pinter's uh, A Kind of Alaska. How did that uh, change the way you approach to work? How did that kind of prominence affect the way you were able to do what you did and, and encourage you perhaps into, into further writing? Well, um, first that experience, uh, which, went, which was really 30 years long, I first met these people in 1966. I went into a hospital and sort of saw these strange, motionless, transfixed figures. Um, I moved into the Bronx to be very close to them. I lived three doors down from the hospital. And so this was really the most intense, intimate, uh, as well as remarkable experience of my life. Um, I got to know these people extremely well as, as individuals. Um, uh, but the uh, awakenings was, was a fantastic event. Uh, it couldn't have been predicted. Um, and uh, I, I hesitated. Um, I always make copious notes. I've kept notebooks since I was 12 or so. Um, I didn't quite know how much I should publish or try to publish. The patients themselves almost pushed me into publication. They said, tell our story or it'll never be known. These were people who had been put away and forgotten for, for decades and, um, and they somehow wanted to feel their lives had significance, if only of exemplars of, of survival um, under the most extraordinary circumstances and, and emergence. And um, the... Um, Hollywood always has its own take, by the way, on stories. Were you, were you satisfied with the way the story came across in the film, Awakenings? Um, the, um, Hollywood expressed an interest um, right back in 1979, but, uh, but it was 10 years before things got going. Um, I confess I was horrified initially uh, when, I, when I saw a script and found that I myself was to be a character. I, I said, leave me out of this. <laughs> I said, no, you know, you are, you are part of the thing. But, but in fact... Um, uh, many modifications were made. I was deeply impressed by the sensitivity of the scriptwriter and of the actors who spent dozens of hours with the patients and the producer. Um, and uh, I think this, this showed in the film, I, 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 most of the film I liked very much. If Hollywood wanted to add a little a love story and a little violence, that, well, Hollywood does. But, but I think, in essence, the, the film was pretty accurate. And, um, uh, and it was above all when one of the patients, one of the original patients, was filmed, although she was not put in the final film, and when she, she could hardly move, but when she gave a little thumbs up sign, when she did a scene with the Nero, she meant, he's okay, it's okay, and then it was okay with me. You went on to write many more fascinating books, and uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat is, is one of my all-time favorites, I have to confess that. How did chronicling these stories and, and putting this all down um, help you better understand your own science? No, um, uh, in health, everything works so beautifully that you can't actually tell what's going on. For example, visually, you think you're given the whole world full of light and color and movement and meaning. Uh, and um, you may have to see people for who have lost a particular thing, for example, who have lost color perception, and that only, uh, as a result of brain damage. And you can only perceive this complexity of the brain and the beautiful orchestration, in a sense, when something goes wrong, when something is dissected out by disease. Um, also, then, you realize the amazing plasticity of the brain and how other parts can come in and take its function. So it's not, you know, if something goes wrong in the brain, it's not like a car engine. The brain will try and take care of it. I was going to ask you that, that, you know, after all these years studying these disorders, have you come away thinking of the brain as something that's fragile or something that's remarkably durable? Both. Um, it's, um, uh, it, it's fragile in that things can happen. Um, but they don't happen all that often, and if they do happen, then there are all sorts of redundancies and fail-safes 
in the brain or, or, or for that matter, in people's personalities. Um, uh, something um, may not recover physically, but there are other ways of doing things. Although in the past five or ten years, we have such a sense of the regenerative powers of the brain, of new brain cells being produced all the while, and of the potential of things like stem cells. So, um, but, uh, but both very robust, and it has to be robust. I mean, anything which has evolved for billions of years has to be pretty tough. What is the most frustrating aspect of the work you do as a neurologist? Um, uh, at one level, um, it's that I can't feel myself into other people's experience totally. I do the best I can, they try and describe it, but I, I, um, uh, I, um, uh, I, would like to, I would like to feel what it's like, say, to be Parkinsonian, to have a stroke, to be colorblind, to be demented, for a little while. What are the rewards then? What's the greatest reward? Having said the opposite, that you can often help people or, or, or get them on a road to helping themselves, and even lives which seem tragically broken can be put together. And secondly, I have to say that one can learn so much. Now, talking of the heavens, asteroid 84928 Oliver Sacks, you actually had an asteroid named after you. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I was very really tickled by this and delighted. Um, I, 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 I sort of, astronomy was one of my love, and I sort of like asteroids. And my two, two of my favorite elements are cerium and palladium, which were named after asteroids. But now I, nice to, to feel I have an asteroid, and I, I almost identify with it. I'm, I'm, I'm three kilometers in diameter, and I orbit the sun every five years. And, you know, people sometimes tell me, you know, you're far out, but now I am. I'm, I'm 425 million kilometers away. It's as near as I'll ever get to heaven. I was very sorry to, to read about uh, the cancer you had diagnosed neurite in, in 2005. And, uh, and I wonder how you dealt with it, knowing so much about the mind and, and knowing, you know, the impact of uh, physiology as well as the psychology, how you dealt with it. Yeah. Um, well, I'd, um, on the visual aspects, I, I've sort of, uh, um, uh, I both regret what has been happening, but I've also been fascinated, and, I, and I've tried to, to study it, because I, I will study myself as I will study any patient. And in particular, say, previously I was very good, I love stereoscopic vision and 3D, and now, now I don't have it. With regard to the cancer itself, um, I was terrified when I got the diagnosis. I thought it was a sort of a death sentence. But these uh, melanomas in the eye uh, tend to stay put and not disseminate. And I, I feel I have a sort of agreement with the melanoma, or at least I hope I do, where I've, I've said, you can have my eye, but leave the rest of me alone. So, so far, this is the situation. Doctors are said to be the, the worst patients. How do you rate yourself? Um, <laughs> well, you'd, you'd have to ask my doctor. <laughs> um, I, I was, um, I, um, I'm not that difficult, but, but I am insatiably curious, and I, I ask a great many questions. Um, on the other hand, I, um, uh, you know, I, I know I have a very good doctor here. I have faith in him, and, uh, and he can, I will follow what he suggests. You continue to write and, and share your knowledge and experience, but is there anything in particular you want to pursue, any particular area you would like to, to pursue? Um, well, several areas. Um, one of them is going to be the whole matter of vision. I've, I've written about people with visual problems in the past, but I have a book of visual essays and stories in mind. My own will be there, but only as a little part of it. But I've also become very interested in mental illness. I had a brother who was schizophrenic who died last year. And um, I, um, I hope I can make some studies of, of schizophrenia. Now, I know you've achieved a lot, but are there any goals you've set yourself? Is there anything in particular you want to achieve? Uh, um, I feel, um, I, I always feel I'm a student. I'm, I'm at the beginning. Um, I would like to achieve sort of more, more understanding, especially of how, of how the brain works. And um, so many things are deeply mysterious. Um, our imagination, our sensibility, our consciousness. Um, I, uh, um, I don't know that I have a notion of any sort of grand, grand breakthroughs, but I, I, I do want to continue 
in, in my own way, seeing people, listening to them, transcribing their experiences, and, and, uh, uh, and this is my contribution. I'm, I'm not one of the world's great theorists, but I think that theories can sometimes be derived from the sort of things which I put together. How will Oliver Sacks be remembered? How would you like to be remembered? Uh, what would you like your lasting legacy to be? Um, you know, I, um, one of my first cousins on my father's side was the late Abba Iban. And I once asked him that, I once asked him that question, and he said that he would like to be remembered as a teacher. And I think I would say the same. Dr. Sachs, it was a real pleasure talking with you. I wish you luck. Thank you. Thank you, sir.